Welcome back to our second class of human factors. Yesterday we talked a lot about the pair model, we talked about some examples that fell, uh, fall into the pair model, and we had an assignment using the pair model to understand how these different factors relate to accidents or mistakes that happen. Today we're going to talk a little more specifically about the application of the pair model to aviation maintenance. This is something called the dirty dozen. Now let's take a look. Some of the most common errors that we see in aviation maintenance are the following bullet points. Incorrect installation of components, we didn't put it in right. Using the wrong parts. Issues with electrical wiring, including when we miswire something. Forgotten tools and parts that are left inside an airplane after it's been repaired. Failure to lubricate items. Failure to secure access panels, fairings, cowlings, inspection panels, cargo doors, you name it fuel or oil caps and fuel panels that are not secured, and failure to remove locking pins, which is something that you'll talk a little bit more with Ed about during ground handling. With these most common errors, there's a lot of different factors that can go into creating these particular errors. That's where the dirty dozen comes in. The dirty dozen is items that have been taken from the pair model and have been crafted specifically to the kinds of issues that we see in aviation maintenance. You can pick these or view these as the most common things to watch out for when we try to audit the work of ourselves and audit the work of others or to understand what risks we have at different phases in the maintenance process. So let's start with number one, lack of communication. Communication takes a lot of different forms in aviation maintenance. We have to communicate verbally with each other, we have to communicate visually if we're using hand signals, and we have to communicate very clearly through maintenance records and changeover records. That is one of the most critical components of communication for a maintenance technician, is appropriate logbook entries and handing things off correctly. If we do not have a clear idea or a clear picture of the maintenance that's been performed or what state the aircraft is in, it opens us up to making very dangerous uh, and potentially deadly mistakes with an aircraft. Some ways we can mitigate that, using our logbooks and worksheets appropriately, making sure that we communicate well with the people that we're working with, and oftentimes before we enter into a maintenance procedure with other mechanics, we can have a brief meeting so that everyone knows what's going to be done, what to look for, and what hand signals to watch for so that we can communicate quickly and efficiently should a problem arise. One of the next is complacency. Complacency ultimately means, and ultimately comes up, when we handle something that we handle quite a bit. Uh, most of us have probably had the uh, somewhat frightening experience of driving a route that we normally drive and upon arrival we realize that we don't actually remember anything about the drive, the route we took, or anything like that. Our brains play a trick on us. The more we perform a task, the more accustomed to that task our brain becomes. Oftentimes that can result in us not having the appropriate attention to detail to perform that task. This can happen as well with maintenance tasks. If we've performed something many, many times, we can tend to not pay as close of attention as we should. Or if it's a routine maintenance item, we may not expect to see any issues because we have performed this task so many times without seeing an issue. Ultimately, to fight this, we need to make sure that we are alert at all times. Every issue that we approach with an aircraft, whether it's routine maintenance or a complex maintenance procedure, we need to approach with the expectation to find something wrong. We also need to make sure that we stay aware that items around what we're working on could also have broken or had a malfunction. So rather than hyper-focusing on the one task we have, we need to look around. If there's a tire that blew out like we see depicted in the picture here, we could replace the tire and pay very close attention to the tire itself. But are we paying attention to the brakes? Are we paying attention to the bearings on that wheel? Are we paying attention to the axle? Are we paying attention to the surrounding area around the wheel well? There's a number of factors to look for. What caused the wheel to detonate? Was there some fundamental problem with the wheel installation? Was there an issue with the hub? Was there an issue with the axle? Additionally, when that wheel uh, came apart, was there any damage that occurred to another part of the aircraft? Did it perhaps fling a chunk of rubber or a tire cord that caused damage to some portion of the structure of the aircraft? By remaining alert and not becoming complacent, we can find these issues and prevent disasters down the road. The next one we're up against is lack of knowledge. Now, this is a challenging one because we really have to rely heavily on our understanding of maintenance manuals and general maintenance practices. 
The problem is, if we come up against something that we are unfamiliar with, we can find ourselves in a situation where we are not comfortable performing the tasks that we need to. This requires us to take a step back. We need to make sure that we thoroughly read the information we have listed in manuals. If we have someone in the shop that can offer a little more experience, then we need to make sure that we ask. A lot of times this can operate against our pride. If we feel like we may take a hit in our reputation as a mechanic because we don't know how to fix something, then we could potentially make the mistake of trying to fix something that we don't know how to fix. However, in all reality, it is highly unlikely that any single mechanic is going to know every single piece of maintenance information about every aircraft that has ever flown. We all have our specializations, we all have weaknesses, and we all have strengths. Many mechanics make the mistake of assuming that their only value is the knowledge they possess. Much more accurately, it has been described to me many times that a mechanic's knowledge comes from knowing when they're out of their league and knowing where to find the correct information. So, if you ever find yourself in a position where you maybe don't have the knowledge to perform a task, take a step back. Try to ask some questions, do some research, and find someone that can help you to understand a little bit better. It's not going to make you look any worse, it's only going to make you look better because the aircraft you work on will not be damaged based on your work. Another common factor we see is distraction. Obviously, aviation maintenance is a very busy and dynamic industry. We have oftentimes multiple problems occurring at once, we have multiple competing priorities, and we can get distracted from tasks. Most commonly we see this during inspections with smaller aircraft. With smaller civil aircraft, a annual inspection, for instance, can take multiple hours if not multiple days. The distraction level comes in when a person is pulled away from that inspection. If you are busy inspecting a landing gear well and something comes up, either you take a phone call, you're called in by a supervisor, and you leave that process, the likelihood of you picking up exactly where you left off in that inspection is very, very low. That's where we have to use different things to try to either eliminate the distractions or find ways to work around those distractions. If you're working on a particular inspection, can the distraction wait until you've completed that inspection? Maybe you can complete the area you're working on before you step away. If that's not the case, we use checklists. Checklists are very, very valuable because as we move through that checklist, we can ensure that we do not forget any area of maintenance that we need to address. If we pay attention to how we're being distracted, we know when we're at risk and we know how to fight those risks. Another issue we see is lack of teamwork. As you have established so far and will continue to see training in an AMT environment, we have to work as a team. This may be a small area. It could be working on an entire aircraft with multiple team members. Ultimately, there are dangerous components on an aircraft if not maintained properly or approached properly. Namely, if we have hydraulic pressure on an aircraft because we are testing some component of the hydraulic system, and another maintenance technician tries to remove and replace some component of the hydraulic system, great damage to the aircraft and potentially lethal results can happen for that mechanic. This is where teamwork comes in. We need to make sure that lines of communication are open. We need to make sure that all of the members of our team know what needs to be accomplished and what their role in that task is. And we also need to make sure that there are no blind spots. We do not want to assign out work to a number of mechanics only to realize later that there was a critical area that was not covered by anyone because no one realized that that hadn't been assigned to somebody else. It's important to know what you're doing, it's important to know what the team is doing, and it's also important to know what your teammates will be doing. Fatigue is another factor that we see in modern aviation. Part of this contributes to the fact that oftentimes we run multiple shifts of maintenance in large commercial operations. This means that virtually around the clock there are maintenance personnel working different shifts to ensure that aircraft can continue flying. While this is a positive method for ensuring that aircraft can make due dates and continue to stay in the air, it does create a problem as throughout the time of day, our natural circadian rhythms, or the cycle that we are used to sleeping in, can fight against us. There's times of the day when we will naturally become less alert, and there's times of the day when we will be more alert. We need to be aware of how fatigue influences us when we're trying to perform different tasks. If we happen to be working a night shift, it may be possible that we're going to be fighting an additional amount of fatigue based on our circadian rhythm. 
So we need to be aware of the symptoms that we exhibit when we start to have a considerable amount of fatigue and what happens when we become less alert or even drowsy. If we stay aware and we self-audit, it can help us to make sure that we're proactive in fighting the uh, ill effects that can come from fatigue. Another problem that comes up consistently is lack of resources. Lack of resources can frequently force mechanics to make choices that they would not have otherwise have made to try to keep an aircraft flying. Ultimately, the statement that you need to remember is use the right tools and the right parts for the job. We may feel like there's a way to work around a solution that could produce considerable, uh, uh, considerable benefits in terms of time cycle for maintenance or getting something ready to fly on time. However, we need to make sure that we use the right resources. Whatever we do, we need to have a basis for the work that we're doing. If we're going to try a uh, repair that would not be our first choice, we need to make sure that that is approved within our maintenance manual or our service manual and it's something that we are legally allowed to do. We do not want to deviate from uh, the resources that we need because we do not currently have them. It can be frustrating and it can cost time, but it does keep aircraft safe and it keeps you out of trouble. A factor that bleeds into this is pressure. Now, continually, because aircraft on the ground lose money, there's going to be a constant pressure from airlines, from flight schools, really from any employer that you work for to keep the airplanes ready to fly. This can dip into that lack of resources problem. One of the issues that can cause a mechanic to become susceptible to a lack of resources issue is the pressure that is being inflicted. Now, we have a very difficult line to toe as mechanics with this pressure. We have to keep things safe. However, oftentimes the insinuation from management can be that your job is on the line if you do not do what they need when they want it. For us, we have to remember one simple fact. When you become a certificated mechanic, that is your livelihood. If you do something that can result in a violation or result in the removal of your license to be a mechanic, you will not get it back. Your profession is done. Keep that in mind, as people may try to pressure you into different, uh, maybe improper procedures or different improper repairs, you need to remember that they are not the ones that have something to lose. The supervisor for a company may lose a bonus or may lose some money for the company. A pilot may lose some time that they wanted to have flying their aircraft. You are the one that stands to lose the most because you can lose your profession for the rest of your life. No matter what happens, whether it's to protect yourself or more importantly, to protect the people who will be flying on aircraft, their safety comes first. It can result in very difficult decisions However, you do not want to find yourself in a position where you have trouble sleeping at night because you made a decision that resulted in someone getting hurt because you caved to pressure. There is no job that is worth retaining to try to have to deal with that. Another issue we see, both with mechanics and flight crews, is lack of assertiveness. This means when you see something wrong, you need to say something about it. Oftentimes, we can fall into the comfortable habit of relying on our supervisors or our inspectors. A lot of times a mechanic can approach a situation and think, well, if it's wrong, someone will tell me it's wrong. That is not the case. Additionally, if we see someone else doing something wrong, then we may have the tendency to assume that they will realize it's wrong. That is also not the case. When we see something, when we see something that's potentially dangerous especially, we need to make sure that we are assertive and we point out the issue may irritate someone because they've already handled that problem, but at least we were able to make sure that the problem was well known and we verified. The accidents that happen that can cause a great deal of damage oftentimes are because someone did not assert themselves when need be. There's a number of NTSB reports of this happening in flight decks as well, where a first officer may bring up something to a pilot but lacks the assertiveness to try to correct the issue and the aircraft winds up crashing. That is not a situation we want to find ourselves in. Our next section is stress. Stress is interesting because we usually think of stress in only one format. We have things going on in our life and it applies pressure. 
really this is anything that can apply pressure and start to alter our ability to perform our job correctly. This can go from personal uh, uh, issues in our life, this can come from pressure from the employer that we're working for, it can come from being worried about layoffs, it can come from any number of things, including our environment. If we're in a very cold or a very hot environment, that induces stress and it can limit our awareness and our ability to perform our task correctly. So, we have to be aware of what different factors will produce stress on us as mechanics and try to find ways to either limit those or know when to step back from a situation if we're under too much stress. Next to last, we have lack of awareness. Now again, this uh, talks a little bit to what we discussed in complacency, but awareness is having your head on a swivel and looking for a problem. We need to see everything around us. Oftentimes, many accidents can occur from something that was simply overlooked by a mechanic because that was not the specific uh, component or system that they were sent to go work on. As we're working on things, we want to be aware of our surroundings. This can help us in two ways. Number one, we can see problems that we may not have been assigned to, but we notice uh, are going to become a problem, like a control cable that's beginning to wear out. On the other hand, it can help to keep us safe. If we are aware of our surroundings, we may see that there is a person in the cockpit and the strobe light on the bottom of the aircraft is starting to rotate, which would indicate that they are going to be starting the engine soon. That kind of situational awareness can help us in a very immediate sense because it can prevent us from becoming hurt in an accident on the ground during maintenance. Our last section is norms, or a shortened form of normal. Ultimately, this is talking about the culture of a workplace, or quote-unquote, the way things are done. Oftentimes, the way things are done can deviate from what the correct procedures are according to our maintenance manuals or other publications. Just because it seems like the normal thing to do, or it seems like a company practice, does not necessarily mean that it's correct. One of the best examples that we have, everybody knows that we are supposed to follow the speed limit on the freeway. However, all it takes is a very brief drive on the freeway to realize that very few people are paying any, if at all, attention to that particular law. It can be very, very easy to allow ourselves to then follow what everyone else is doing. This works well until we happen to be the one person that gets pulled over by the state trooper and we now wonder how is it that they decided to choose us out of the crowd. Just because everyone else is doing it does not mean it is the thing to do. These are the dirty dozen. These are the factors that we're looking for specifically in aviation maintenance that can contribute to problems. We're going to have a brief exercise on this in our assignment today, and starting tomorrow, as we continue to work through this, we're going to take a look at a number of different incidents and accidents in aviation and try to identify the human factors that contributed to those accidents being the case. Thanks for listening. Look forward to your responses. I think you'll enjoy tomorrow.